talk about three different things this morning. I'd first like to talk about the Polar Northern Virginia Veterans Care Center and what it means for our region of the state. Secondly, I'd like to talk about some of the things we did during the completed 2017 session of the General Assembly. And then thirdly, to look ahead to what we've got on the docket and plan for the 2018 session of the Virginia General Assembly. So first, so I've got three things to talk to you about. Uh, both, most of you have worn a uniform and you remember in your most basic training, they told you, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So, <laughs> I've told you what I'm gonna tell you, now let me tell you. The Northern Virginia <laughs> Veterans Care Center is really a good news story for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Currently, we have two Veterans Care Centers, one located in Roanoke, near the VA Med Center in Roanoke, in Salem. Secondly, we have one in Richmond, the Sitter and Barford Veterans Care Center, named after two Medal of Honor recipients, and also located adjacent to the McGuire Regional VA Medical Center. <clears throat> what we do now is by fielding these additional two centers to bring the complement up to four Virginia Veterans Care Centers, we will cover all the corners of the state. We will have, we have the one in Southwest Virginia at Salem. We have one in Central Virginia that covers that area and Southside Virginia. We will field the one up here, and I'll talk about that specifically, and it's representative of what we will do at the fourth location down in Virginia Beach. So we will have good coverage for the Commonwealth of Virginia. A lot of states have done these. They're wonderful complements to the federal VA system, which is absolutely congested and probably one could say under-resourced. And so as a result, it bears a lot of the burden. Now, I think the name is, is somewhat misleading, Virginia Veterans Care Center. It does not do outpatient care. It is more like a veteran's home. Think about a permanent residence for veterans who need intensive care. But there is also a mission uh, included where they can do transitional work with individuals with TBI or PTS and transitioning out of the services. PTSD is no longer in vogue. The D has now been taken off of the nomenclature, as a lot of you know. So um, this year, we carried a bill, myself and Delegate Kirk Cox, who is the speaker designate, he'll be elected speaker of the House of Delegates in January, carried a bill that would field a Northern Virginia Veterans Care Center. There was a second bill that was carried by Delegate Kirk uh, Stiley from Virginia Beach, which will field the, the, the Hampton Roads Virginia Veterans Care Center. So what w the requirement was simply this. We had to have, the locality had to come up with the first piece of the project, and that was land acquisition, and it had to be donated by the locality. So there was no cost to the Commonwealth or to the federal government. And I worked with the Prince William Board of County Supervisors to get 25 acres donated, but there were two other localities that competed, Fauquier County and Stafford County. In the end, Fauquier County was selected which I have no qualm with because it's right on the Fauquier Prince William County border. It's located at the site of the old Vent Hill Farm Station, the joint U.S. Army NSA facility that closed in the early 90s. It's a wonderful piece of ground, but the beauty is it's a little more centrally located than the parcel of land that we had identified in the city of Manassas at a former park, and it's also um, uh, they were able to donate a full 30 acres rather than 25 with an option for further expansion using some adjacent ground. That translates to growth capacity over the years. So that's the beauty of the Fauquier location. And so it's well situated. Now the first piece was the land acquisition. Second was the cost. And that's normally borne by rough, in rough terms, a 60-40 split between the federal and state government with the VA taking the largest portion of the cost of construction. However, there are so many states who have been asking for a decade for these kinds of money that simply we were like, I think we were 50, 48, something like that on the list, which means in the out years it would be a protracted wait. We just simply wouldn't see it. So the executive, and the legislative branches sat down and talked about how to move forward. And what we decided to do was through bonding embed in the Virginia state budget um, a sufficient amount of monies for Virginia to bear the burden alone of constructing the facility because we have so many folks that need these services. And so that's how we're proceeding. Virginia is going to bear the burden of construction. What will happen is later, 
if those federal accounts are funded in a more healthy way, we may go back and ask for reimbursement, but this is a risk we're willing to assume, and I, I believe most people agree with that. So that's the second part. We've talked about land acquisition, construction. The third piece is obviously operations and maintenance of the facility. It is not a line item in the Virginia or the federal budget simply because it is funded by the stipend, Medicaid and Medicare, that those individuals who reside there receive. So it's self-sustaining. If you've been in the Sitter and Barfoot Center, you will see these are really five-star facilities. They are typically 120 or I'm sorry, 240 beds in the facility. But now, um, because we are doing this on our own, we downsize the, the scope of the project and it's going to be 120 residents who are there. And, uh, but we have expansion capability in the out years. We did that with the Center and Barfoot Virginia Veterans Care Center in Richmond. So we will follow that same model. Um, the charts that you see up here, um, are pretty representative of where the architectural plans are right now. And as you can see, it is a very nice facility. It, this is the basic layout, the configuration looking from the vertical. And the beauty is that there are there is a fairly mature uh, dementia unit. And it's constructed in such a way that the residents are able to go outdoors in, in a protected courtyard, and there's no risk of their leaving the facility. And so they're able to experience time outdoors on their own if they're able to do so. Um, I've been in the, uh, the Sitter and Barfoot facility uh, a number of times. I've been on their dementia unit. It is, it is just pristine. It's wonderful. And so this is, this is a great addition for Northern Virginia. Um, this gives you uh, uh, all these these uh, graphics give you a representation of what it's going to be like and I'm so impressed with the Sitter and Barfoot facility and I believe this is light years beyond because this has been constructed using new new construction concepts and uh, it is, it is a, a very good facility. So I just found out yesterday that they have identified the groundbreaking date and that will be on October 26th at 1 in the afternoon. I'm presuming that the governor will be here for that. It'll involve the Prince William delegation to the General Assembly, House and Senate alike, and of course the general public. Um, what I'll do is I will ask Tommy to stay in touch with you, Suzanne, uh, with the logistics and the details so that you can advertise that to folks that are interested. Um, I was really surprised that we're going to do it in October. I thought it would have been later in the year, but the construction timeline uh, is for a two-year construction period, so we'll swing the doors open in late 2019 and take in the first residence. The beauty is it creates not only 120 um, billets, if you will, for the residents, but it also creates about 150 jobs in the area and it is also economic stimulus for the area simply because they've got to buy supplies and beds and carpets and ad infinitum, everything that's required to operate the facility. So for Western Prince William and Fauquier, it's going to provide a significant economic stimulus, I believe. Um, while that's going on, the same thing will be mirrored down in Virginia Beach. Uh, this facility is named after the Polar family. It's not named after an individual Polar, but the family, because the family obviously has a pretty noble name uh, in the annals of American military history. Chesty Polar, the father, his son, and then his son's wife, uh, former Senator Toddy Polar, who was very active in veterans' issues. And in fact, she and I would carry a lot of legislation together for veterans when she was in the Senate. She's, of course, now retired, and we miss her. But um, at any rate, that's, uh, that will tell you a little bit about the Northern Virginia Veterans Care Center. Let me talk about the 2017 session of the General Assembly that just concluded. Um, we had a pretty rigorous schedule of uh, veterans issues that we moved through the General Assembly. Let me just real quickly lay out for you the process on how that works. It, there are really two avenues of approach where concepts make their way into legislation that actually makes its way through the system and either dies but hopefully survives. And so here's the way it works. Obviously, individually, any delegate or senator 
member of either house can submit a piece of legislation dealing with any issue and of course in this case we're talking about veterans so that's that's uh, a given that there are pieces of legislation that come in simply because a delegate or a senator wishes to carry it but our main avenue of approach one that I think is more representative of the wishes of the 800,000 Virginia veterans who comprise our veterans population in the state. And incidentally, we have almost 50,000 in Prince William County. When I tell people that, uh, you probably already know it, but most people don't realize that we have such a veteran intensive population in Prince William County. So the Avenue approach is through an organization that's called the JLC, which is short for the Joint Leadership Council of Veteran Service Organizations. It's created by executive order. The last two governors have used it. It's a very good process. I suspect that it will stay in, uh, in use uh, for future gubernatorial administrations. It's a very useful business model. The JLC consists of, I believe it's 27 veteran service organizations, whether it's the VFW, the American Legion, the Vietnam Veterans of America, the Air Force Sergeants Association, blah, 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 right down the line. And they meet on a quarterly basis, usually in the Richmond area. Each organization has a primary rep and an alternate rep. And they meet, and together over the space of about six to eight months, they construct a list of usually about a half dozen veterans' priorities that they want to make their way from the Joint Leadership Council to the governor, and then he and his circle can make a decision what will be moved into the General Assembly as quote-unquote governor's bills. In other words, they have the direct support of the chief executive. Um, others may not get that sort of designation by the governor's office, and then, then any delegate can take the bill, any senator can take the bill, and move it through the process. Typically, about six are done every year. Um, they try to keep it down so that they focus on a limited number of issues that are of need in the Commonwealth of Virginia. One of the things that was very important to them was this construction of the two additional Virginia Veterans Care Centers. Um, they've also been very focused on what is called the V3 program, the Virginia Values Veterans Program. Some of you in your civilian employment are familiar with it, and I know the Chamber is familiar with it because you're certified as an instructing organization, I believe. Yes, okay, because I've attended some of those sessions in this room. And uh, that's a program, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, by which the Virginia Department of Veteran Services and any of its certified agents can train and certify businesses to hire veterans, to teach them what is the Air Force Specialty Code, what is an MOS, how to take a military resume and translate it into plain English and to be able to discern what skills that represents that are useful in that industry. And so we started out with a goal to do 10,000. And in 2013, in the House, I carried the bill that created the V3 program. There was a companion bill over the Senate that Senator Toddy Puller, who I mentioned earlier, she carried that. And the beauty of that is um, it increases the chances for a piece of legislation to make it through both houses uh, intact. Because as a House Republican, I'm able to get it through the House, through my caucus. Toddy's able to get it through the Senate, through her caucus. And as they cross over, it's going to have broad support among both houses, both parties. And it's a pretty good way to approach things that are important. In fact, in Richmond, um, and I really like this as chairman of the Military and Veterans Caucus, uh, along with Senator Bryce Reeves, he's the co-chair. We have a senator and a delegate who co-chair. Um, we're really unified on all these issues. There's really not an inch of daylight. There's not a centimeter of daylight on these veterans issues between either house, between either party, or between any branches of government. It's pretty unified. Thank and you. I like uh, <laughs> presiding over that process. Uh, it's a very clean process, and I get to hang out with literally thousands of people wired like all of us in this room. So, so uh, the Joint Leadership Council is really the avenue of approach. So when somebody comes to me with an idea, I like to, it's usually a veteran, and so I like to direct them to their veteran service organization that they may be a member of or at least have access to if they're not a member of an organization and get it vetted through the JLC process because then it puts the fingerprints of the broader Virginia veterans community on the whole thing. So that's how it, it works. So we had a pretty good year in 2017. Um, 
and now that we have gone over 26,000 individuals hired under the V3 program, what I want to do is over the next four years, I'd like for us to set a goal of 50,000 hired under the V3 program statewide. And uh, as a member of the House Appropriations Committee, which writes the budget, um, I would like to make sure that the necessary resources are there so that we can continue that march. So uh, we'll see how she goes, but it's, it's just a wonderful program, and it's kind of the envy of a lot of other states that don't have this. I know legislators from all 50 states, because I'm in a thing called the National Conference of State Legislatures, and uh, it's bipartisan, and everybody uh, is, I constantly get emails and phone calls from people asking about how do we do X, Y, or Z in Virginia for veterans. So uh, uh, in 2018, <clears throat> let me just hit a couple of things for you that are on the horizon. Um, last week I went to Richmond for the Joint Leadership Council meeting. I'm not a member. I go in, I sit in the back of the room so I can listen to their thought processes as they construct their list of legislative priorities. That way, those that make it into the form of bills and start navigating its way through the House and Senate uh, I understand the mindset that resulted in that particular piece of legislation and I can be a more effective spokesman when I go testify to that House or Senate committee. Um, but this year they're looking for such things as, and there are right now six priorities that they're working on, and I had to leave that meeting in Richmond to get back here for some other things, so I didn't, I was not present to see which ones they actually voted on to accept as part of their priority package. So uh, I need to backtrack and find out what they have actually decided on. But here's what we discussed at that meeting. Um, first of all, that the 2018 General Assembly passed resolutions uh, identical to one that we passed in 2017. Um, which would provide parity for surviving spouses of 100% disabled veterans and those who are designated by the federal government as KIA, killed in action. And so um, what that does is it lets uh, the surviving spouse of, of a veteran who has been killed or is 100% disabled to in fact get a local property tax um, break, if you will, on their primary residence before they lost it if they moved residences. So um, that that's, uh, will be the second constitutional amendment. We have a thing in Virginia, a process by which we amend the Constitution. It has to pass in one General Assembly, in the second year of a General Assembly, then you have an election. Then the same th proposal has to be presented in the form of another bill in a separate session of a General Assembly that's separated by an intervening election. So you have two separate General Assembly sessions comprised of different people making this value judgment before you actually put it on, a, uh, on the uh, ballot in November for the people to vote on at the same time they vote for their candidates for office. So, um, so that is underway and I don't think that that is going to have a problem at all and that's a fairly high priority thing. Um, then we have two bills, one that would permit um, the 100% service-connected disabled veterans um, who are at the low, low end of the, social, the economic, the earnings uh, ladder uh, to do a, what they call an income subtraction on their income taxes. And the same thing, and a separate proposal is to do the same thing for Virginia National Guard members. Incidentally, I will say this about the National Guard because I heard it mentioned earlier. The, uh, we have a significant number of Virginia National Guardmen, Guardsmen deployed to places in the Middle East. Uh, I went to a deployment ceremony last month at uh, um, Dulles Airport and they are now over in the Middle East for a full year. Um, and on Sunday, I will go to Fort Belvoir for activation of the 91st Cyber Brigade. The United States Army and Air National Guard in Virginia are assuming some pretty mainstream frontline missions. Um, so we do have a lot of folks uh, deployed. Um, the next thing is that um, there is a program called Viz MESDEP, which stands for the the uh, 
Virginia Military Survivors and Dependents Education Program, and that is to give a tuition break for mili Virginia military survivors and their dependents in Virginia public colleges and universities. My forecast is that that is going to have some rough sledding uh, in the General Assembly if they in fact take it forward for us to consider simply because it has a 2.5 million dollar cost to it that we will have to identify um, in the budget to move money over to that. So I think that that's going to have some rough sledding. It was proposed last year. It didn't get out of committee. Uh, and then lastly, and I believe in this also, but it's going to have rough sledding. And that is that the governor and the General Assembly enact legislation and do the, provide the necessary budgetary support for a pilot program to permit the electronic return of absentee ballots by Virginia's deployed service members. So service members overseas. Right now, it's uh, lick an envelope and put a stamp on it and send it back. My very first bill in 2010, as I approach the end of our discussion here, is was to uh, provide earlier dates that registrars of voters in every locality, every ju jurisdiction had to comply with, and that was 45 days. They had to postmark ballots to deploy overseas military members to give those ballots time to get there to be processed and then returned back to their jurisdiction where they vote in Virginia. Um, that was passed, it was great, but it's still a challenge because it involves the physical movement of paper through the U.S. Postal Service. This will permit them, these deployed overseas military members, to in fact vote electronically and it would incorporate uh, encrypted systems to include use of the CAT card, the common access card, which is what a military, I know before I retired with my CAT card, I was in the early years of the CAT card, I retired eight years ago, you know, you had to insert the CAT card into a reader to get access to the SIPRNet, to the classified internet. So it is highly encrypted, highly safe, and I'm hoping to uh, see that pass through. I've carried a bill to try to get it done in prior years. Um, several other delegates have carried bills to try to get it through, and it always dies in a subcommittee of the Privileges and Elections Committee. That's the committee that considers all election law. But I'm hoping that uh, we can eventually get that through. So we'll see how it goes. But that's a look at some of the things that have come out of the Joint Leadership Council um, that are hopefully going to wing their way to the General Assembly for consideration. Um, and there'll be other things also that will be carried individually by legislators in either house. So with that, that kind of gives you a look ahead. We've got a pretty good system. In fact, um, there's a, a Maryland delegate who's been in touch with me. I've had some telephone conversations with him. They are at the front end of creating their own General Assembly Military and Veterans Caucus, and uh, he's going to come down with a contingent of uh, delegates and senators from the Maryland General Assembly to see how we do it in Virginia because they're wanting to replicate that. So, uh, so there you go. Um, that kind of gives you a little glimpse back and forward. Again, uh, you've got a warm in invitation to come to this, and we'll just use the chamber as an outlet to try to get the word out to members of the, of the body.